on this episode of AV Week, where integrators need to go to get the rules and regulations that are impacting their business. What are the biggest issues and challenges of 2019 and developing masterclasses for AV disciplines? All that and more next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 379, recorded Friday, November 30th, 2018. Star. The support for AV Nation is brought to you by Kramer, AV Beyond the Box, and by Chief, the global leader in commercial AV mounting solutions. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audio, visual, news, and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host. With us to discuss the news and information we have gathered this week, first and foremost, a longtime friend of, of me and of this program. His name is Simon Dudley, and he works for Logitech. Welcome, sir. Hi, oh, yeah, Tim. It's great to see you, mate. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, a couple of newbies here, so Simon, be nice to them. Uh, first and foremost, Jordy Kleber. Uh, Jordy is from Biamp. Welcome, sir. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, thank you. Uh, and also with us is Rob uh, Viren. Rob is from uh, uh, Legrand AV. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Hello. Nice to meet you. All right. Uh, first story we, got, we have help here, guys. Um, comes to us from our friends over at Commercial Integrator. How to comply with small business regula- regulations affecting AV integrators. Quote, unquote, from the article frequently av integrators are given conflicting information on a project and also locally uh, information that seems to contradict ongoing workplace safety provisions and requirements rob i'm going to start with you on this um there are a lot of uh, information a lot of sources of information for regulations both from a national level and a, a local level depending on where you are i know in certain parts of the country you have to be a certified electrician to do certain types of work, even low voltage certain types of work. Other parts of the country, that's not necessarily the case. So when it comes to helping dealers getting the right information, what do you guys think the best source is uh, for both manufacturers and for integrators to getting the, the honestly, the regulations that they are, um, they're subject to? So uh, one of the websites I primarily use dealing with counties is a website called nago.org. Uh, NACO, uh, National Association of Counties. Uh, they give you the website for the counties, which is generally the best place to find the, the information for that specific county. Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with work regulation, things like OSHA primarily, and you always want to get those from the primary source. You don't necessarily want to get one from even just uh, the contractor or where you're sourcing those from because you could get an old version and an updated version. Generally speaking, they keep the websites up to date uh, and that documentation, or you can contract contact them directly uh, via phone or something related to that. It, it's You always want to make sure to question first and verify. You don't necessarily want to trust the information just because it's on, a, on an official looking document. You want to make sure to, to get that information again from primary source. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, issues around this can be solved culturally. So you can actually, just having a questioning attitude is actually a great place to start. So if you go, uh, do I have the capacity to plug this in, this low power, uh, or do I have capacity to go through this wall, right? Just starting with saying <laughs> something we, we used to call in the nuclear industry called STAR, which is stop, think, act, review, is actually a, a really tremendous thing. So stopping and thinking <laughs> being the first two results of that uh, is 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 as silly as it sounds just saying, should I be doing this? And then thinking about it, acting, and then reviewing whether or not that was the proper action to take um, are some of the easiest ways of doing that. Yeah. Uh, Simon, when it comes to, from an industry standpoint, it, it, are there, you, uh, Rob mentioned that the, the NACO website for the uh, so National Association of, of, of Counties, but is this something that, that, that a VIXA or you know, uh, CDA, NSCA, other organizations should at least make an effort, and, and some of them do, um, to make sure that their their members understand what some of these regulations and how they impact them. Yeah, I think that, I think it's a, a fair statement, Sam. I think they do. Uh, I think they should. 
as you can imagine, we as a multinational company, we sell into, I think, 130 countries or something crazy. We have more than just the, the national accreditations or, or rules that we've got to obey by. So one of the things we never bother trying to do is learn it all ourselves. So even as a big manufacturer like us, we always use consultants because if you don't, then your people are spending their entire time keeping up to date with a whole bunch of regulation, which you only need to use probably once a year. If you use consultants, then they're doing this all the time for lots of other people and they can advise you pretty quickly and pretty easily. So our advice on a sort of smaller scale for most of the reseller partners watching this is don't try and keep up yourself. You probably won't manage it. It'll be an enormous job better to pay a consultant a bit of time and a bit of money to get it done for you. And just make certain you do a yearly audit and make certain you keep up to date as, as much as you can. It's pretty hard to do so, but much as you can by getting others to do it for you. Oh, very good. Uh, Jordy, from a standpoint from, from Biamp and, and creating products, it, you know, just like Simon, you guys are also multinational. Is that the same kind of concept where you guys, where you lean on folks who have done this before and depending on the region of the world really, um, they kind of help you direct, they help direct you to the regulations that you need to be, that you need to pay attention to. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'll echo what Simon said. He's spot on. It, the problem with dealing with these regulations and new, new, some things, common sense, Stop, think, act. I really like that, that idea of basically just making sure that you kind of think before you do a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of different regulatory issues and concerns and compliance and certifications and programs and such throughout the world. And uh, even even within the, the limited sphere of, of influence that I've had with respect to working with our partners and customers, there's a lot of variations in there, even within the same country, sometimes within the same region. So leveraging somebody who has some local expertise is really important. Uh, and again, you can spend all the time in the world trying to develop that expertise, or you can just, like any many other professions, one of my favorite examples is the medical industry, where you don't have one doctor, one physician that does everything. You've got a bunch of specialists for good reason. There's a lot to know and a lot to understand. So leverage the, the, uh, the talent when you need it and focus on actually developing your expertise and what your skills are. All right, very good. Uh, next story here comes to us from our friends over at AV Magazine. Uh, Master of Projection Mapping, uh, Bart Cressa, is opening up a design training academy from the article, quote unquote, uh, training will take place at Cressa Studios in Lublin, Poland, as well as at a classroom uh, and gallery spaces at the renowned C uh, Center for Meeting of the Cultures, also in Lublin. Uh, students will have access to computer workstations equipped with design software, and pupils will be able to have uh, two meetings a, a month uh, in the space uh, with in-studio work time. Uh, Jordi, I want to start with you on this. This is an interesting take on part of AV, where you know, Bart is taking uh, projection mapping and honestly creating a, a master class in how to do this. What other areas of the AV industry should we treat like this? What other areas should we have kind of a dedicated uh, course or, or do we need to have a dedicated course like this projection mapping course? Yeah, so this is actually an interesting example. Um, so I'm not an AV professional. I'm actually relatively new to the industry. I came into Biamp about a year and a half ago and this is my first foray into the professional AV space. I'm from the IT world and I, was, I came into Biamp specifically to do networking and one of the things that I've found throughout my travels around is that in the AV industry, everyone's pretty much dependent upon some form of networking these days, but there's a, a scarcity of, of expertise with respect to how to actually do what I'll call disciplined networking uh, designs and such. I mean, there's a lot of people that understand some of the basics, if you will, and there's some talented people as well, but it's a whole separate discipline. And one of the things I found myself tasked with quite a bit is actually just helping people demystify some of the, the pain points around how to build a network to support AV solutions. And I've actually thought, boy, wouldn't it be a great idea if we had some way to have like a dedicated training uh, focus with some uh, classes and whatnot to actually support making, uh, taking an AV professional and not turning them into a networking pro because that's, that's a bit excessive but adding kind of some layers to it so that you can leverage the AV talent and build in some networking expertise so that they can actually leverage some of the newer technology that's necessary to build a modern AV system. I would actually go to that class. I would, I would love that class. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rob, same kind of question. What, what, what else do we need to have a focused uh, course or a focused discipline like this on? 
So I, I absolutely agree with Jordi uh, in terms of IT networking, especially as AV over IP becomes more of the standard. Uh, it's going to continue to be imperative that they understand about uh, how loop back and you can crash the network and making sure you build in the bandwidth and what sort of uh, network you're going to need to spec because you'll start having, well, I mean, continue having dedicated networks for I, uh, AV and those will become more and more important about what switches you're putting in about how those are configured so that your new uh, AV over IP network can function. Uh, looking at it from just a what, a, what a different thing would be, uh, a different kind of training could be, I still think that safety training, um, fall protection, things of that nature are pretty critical. Just looking at the statistics about what sort of risks you can run into, like the risk of networking is, you know, you, you have trouble installing, but at least fall <laughs> risk and, and, and injury to employees is, is very costly. Uh, and and obviously everybody wants to go home the same way they came in that day. So any sort of training in that regard can be uh, a nice risk mitigation and a nice uh, way of keeping people safe. So I don't know. <laughs> Two cents on that. Absolutely, I like that one. Yeah, uh, Simon, uh, you wrap up here with you. What what uh, what are one or two things that uh, we as an industry could probably focus on and create a, a master class or a dedicated course for? Yeah, I've been thinking about that, and and I love what Jordy and Rob both say. But my mind went in a different direction when when I was posed this question. Um, one of the things that's always annoyed the living daylights is go with that out of me over the last 25 years or so is so many companies put the, you know, the technology I come out of my, my video conferencing space, they put the technology in, uh, an IT team put the technology in, they whisper under somebody's door, but we put video in and then everyone carries on doing business exactly the same way they did previously. And there is an argument that says that, that when you put in a new CRM system or a new, workflow solution within an organization, then you may well get, organizations may well get, one of the professional services companies, you know, maybe as big as an EW or a, P, a K, KPMG or a whoever else, one of these big companies who help you redesign the way that you actually go and work. Hmm. Um, so a kind of a sense of business process re-engineering. And you put in a new email system, well, maybe not an email system initially, like the first one you ever put in, it changed the way you did business. Um, the first telephony system, if anyone can remember back that far, that changed the way you did business. But so many organizations put video conferencing in as an IT project, but it's not a business project. And as a result, all the business people keep walking straight past the video conferencing equipped rooms to get on an airplane to fly somewhere else to do business they've always, in the same way they've always done it. And for me, that's highly frustrating. In fact, I went to see, and it shows how long ago, because it was Coopers and Librand at the time. Um, so how long ago was that when it was just C&L? Um, Coopers and Librand, when I saw them 20 years ago, I suppose it must have been, and said, there is a business here for you to re-educate business process, re-engineering on how to make video conferencing cost effective and useful and transformative within your business. And they went, oh, that's nice. And then, you know, I think I remember they gave me a nice cup of tea and a Jaffa cake and sent me on my way and, and they never did anything. And I do think that, you know, you're looking at training courses. We talk all the time about putting new technology in, but we don't talk about how putting that technology in could redefine how a business does business. Yeah. And to me, that seems a mass missed opportunity. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely, it is. because you, you know you look at at you know Avixa for the past year, uh, actually past two or three years, uh, has been beating the drum of experience, and that actually goes right into that, where you know if folks don't know that this can change their work, if they don't know that it can change their experience in the office, then they won't use it, they won't utilize it, and then their experience is nil, honestly. Well, it's a, it's part of the problem that IT is typically given a budget and told, go and do good things with your IT budget. And one of the things they do is video collab and they put all this technology in, but they don't redefine how they do business as a result. A, a perfect example, I'll give you a great example, a little one. Uh, I worked with a big chocolate manufacturer in the UK years ago and they had three offices and each of their, each of their senior people would basically spend a 
whole bunch of hours driving between the three offices. They're all 100 miles apart. And we put in video conferencing and we put in a simple, if you want to travel, travel request form was uh, fill in this form and, uh, and you, can, you can travel. And it would, the box just was put te in 10 words or more justify why you can't do this over video. And they all complained, oh, we can't do that. The reality is if you put 10 words or more into that box, your travel was approved. So you could write the cat sat on the mat, the cat sat on the mat, and you would get your travel approved. You know what it did? Video conferencing took off because it forced people to go, oh, actually, maybe I'll think about using video. And it made a big difference. So I just think that that's a very simple example, but I think companies don't understand how this technology can change the way they do business. Yeah, absolutely. That, 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 that's a great story because you're right. It forces people to realize what do we have and, and how can we utilize it. Um, all right, uh, wrapping up here um, from our friends over at, uh, at SCN and AV Network. Uh, they released their, their, their top 50 uh, integrators. And in doing so, um, Megan Dutta actually interviewed a number of them and asked the biggest business challenge of 2018. So I'm going to take uh, Megan's question and ask it to you gentlemen. Uh, here, uh, Simon, we'll start with you on this. When it comes to 2018, moving into 2019, we're recording this at the end, end of November, so folks are already starting to plan for, for next year. What are the biggest challenges we face as an AV industry going into 2019? I think, it's, I think there's three, uh, and they're probably not all equally weighted. So I'll, I'll say all three, and then I'll give you a bit of color on each. Okay. I'd argue talent, services, and consolidation. So let's talk about talent first. So talent, how many people, how many people fail to train any new staff and then complain that their new staff aren't very good? Right? Has that ever happened before? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. When, when, I, when I was a kid, like you know, many years ago, when I was uh, first in business at 18, I, I, didn't, I wasn't allowed to sit down without being told what to do for the first year. Today, people are given a business card and a laptop, and you deal with it. I mean, there's an old line that most of the industry is basically the strap line. The entire AV IT industry is you work it out. And we do that to our own people, and we do that to our customers. And I think that, obviously, no one who listens to this show, they're all wonderful, but others, there's other people, right? So I would argue that talent acquisition and then talent training. I, I worked for a company a couple of years ago and uh, I worked with a company a couple of years ago. And when I said to them, let's train our salespeople, they said, well, we pay them a bunch of money. Why would we want to train them? And, you know, as Richard Branson said, the problem is if you train people and they leave, that's bad. But if you don't train people and they stay, that's worse. Yep. So I would argue talent and training of people. The next one is services. I think that, and I've written about this quite extensively, the services model, the, the pay per play, the, instead of selling a box to a client, selling them a service, which may have a box, may not have a box attached, is fundamentally changing the AV, IT world. And most organizations, many organizations, haven't worked out how to do that. And that changes everything from when's a deal done, right? If, if you do a 36th of a deal every month, is it done at the end of the first month or is it done at the end of the 36th month? And of course that therefore changes your sales process, who's even in sales, how many you pay people. That's a big problem. And then the last one, and I know I'm sort of begging too much here, no. consolidation in the industry. There's probably all sorts of noise going on about who's buying who for what and why at this point. And I think that that's likely to continue. And I'm saying that without any knowledge, but uh, that's likely to continue. And so as for all the AV partners out there and their customers, you've got to be careful about who you're partnering with as a business because who knows who's going to be belonging to whom within a year or so. Yeah. And I think that that could be at least something to consider. Less important than talent, less important than services, but still consideration. Yeah, absolutely. The consolidation is, it will absolutely continue. Uh, and I don't know anything either, but you know, it, it just seems to be the, the way of the world now. So, uh, Rob, get your two cents on this. What are, what are two or three things that, uh, that are challenging us as an AV industry going into 2019? So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, the head on the nail there, Simon. Uh, I think along the same lines with that, uh, revenue model changes, like you said, the services, and the uh, tightening margins are all sort of a consequence of the consolidation. You're starting to get a little bit more cookie cutter models 
with some of these things and you really have to be challenged with how you can not necessarily play the margins game, but really find a way of driving higher value for your customers. And that sort of uh, builds off of some of the training you guys were talking about earlier with the projection, being able to bring novel services because more and more, like you, you said, they bundle in the stuff in the IT crowd and it, it doesn't necessarily drive a lot of value, but finding ways to do novel and unique things or build business transformation having some of those skills really allows you to have a, to drive higher value, which is always a lot more fun than, than trying to sell the same product or service for, for less is instead trying to find how can I bring the customer more from less. <laughs> so I think uh, really with the consolidation, finding areas of differentiation, sounding out as organizations, even with all the consolidation and, and being able to, deliver more as an industry as opposed to just say, hey, we have this new widget. Because really, I think we're getting to the end of where, as a manufacturer myself, you know, this camera has somehow this even better imager. Like people are starting to squint and saying, is 4K really that much better than 1080p? You know, considering Zoom is going to limit us down to 720p anyway, right? I mean, you, you, you can't say that this 10% better imaging module is somehow this most fantastic change. You have to figure out better and better, more interesting experiences. And it becomes these softer items like solution selling or service selling, where still the, the central goal of making the experience better for the customer is not moving. It's, it's always been that. It's just the ways in which we're doing that is becoming harder and the world is becoming harder. But, you know, you just got to get better. So how do we do that? And I, I think, again, that is uh, reevaluating how we do training. You know, we, we don't have cheap, talented labor out there. Welcome to the, to the new world where, guess what? People are getting paid more and they're expecting, expecting more and people with the talent are going somewhere else, right? You, know, you, you need to build that talent and people will stay as a result of that. So, mm, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, Jordy. Uh, I know you've only been uh, in our in our industry for a year or so, but still, give us uh, give us two or three things that, that are going to be challenges next year. Yeah, no. So I think you've assembled quite a hive mind here. So I agree with what Simon and, and Rob have said about their their challenges. In fact, I'm just going to add a little bit of color from my perspective. So we're 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 kind of orbiting around this idea of talent. So talent management in the sense of how can we find the people that we need and how can we keep the people trained that we need. And training is a big component of that. I think that there's, uh, there's, two, there's two angles to that. The first is training our people for new things. Like Rob was just talking about new experiences and how there are other industries that are literally setting the bar in terms of expectations for what their experiences are like. So I come from the cloud computing industry and, and the same pressures are there. So it's not just about putting a video on a screen or putting audio out of a speaker these days. It's about making it very easy to consume as well. So how do we manage that mix of simultaneously doing a solutions approach and meeting the needs and expectations of our customers while also managing our own talent pool? And the, the, the uh, article that you mentioned had several quotes from several people. I found some of them were very good. One of them mentioned kissing a lot of frogs in order to find the appropriate level of talent. Uh, and there was another discussion about how the AV industry itself seems to be a little bit of a hidden gem. And I think that that's very true. I had no idea until I joined the industry uh, what the breadth and depth of what it was. I mean, I always knew about what AV was, but I didn't understand how it operated and what kind of opportunities were in that. So one of the things that might be interesting is like reach out to universities. Like we, I know here at BIAMP, we actually work with uh, Oregon State University. We work, reach out and integrate with them to figure out what they're doing in terms of training their students, but also try to promote some scholarships for some new staff development, some new, new talent, if you will. Yeah. And then simultaneous, you know, and also spinning it up. I've actually took, I've spoken with a couple of people that are just getting into the industry, uh, having left school and even they didn't realize necessarily what type of opportunities were there or what types of roles were there. They wanted to get involved with technology and engineering, but they didn't really understand how all this thing, how all these things kind of work together. Everyone wants to go for work at Google or Amazon or something. And mm -hmm. there's a whole other like subset of the, of the universe out there. And once they kind of peeled back some of the layers, they realized, Oh, this could be really cool. So I think that the hidden gem of the industry needs to be marketed a little bit better. So, and that's all of us, that's the entire industry. I mean, like, you know, reaching out to people and, and making sure that they know it. 
The second angle on that is also training and developing the existing staff that we have. More and more emphasis is being pushed on this explosion of technologies and engineering and products and everything else that we're using to build our solutions. So it's going to become more important in the, the, what Simon was saying about training and the idea of how important it is. It is going to be more important, I think, than it ever has been in the past in the sense that we need to target what, we, what it is that we know and continually develop ourselves in that. So leveraging not just the available, what I'll call like marketing collateral in terms of the speeds and feeds of products, but actually learning about how things work. And like I mentioned, networking earlier, spreading out into some of these new disciplines as well. Uh, and, exp and expanding our own scope of, uh, of knowledge and expertise. Um, a lot of that, in my mind, comes around this idea of automation. Like we, like Rob spent a lot of time talking about, you know, you don't really, do you really need 4K? Well, yeah, it's this gee whiz bang kind of thing. But um, in order to support some of these newer technologies, we got to also move away from doing a lot of the manual labor that we've done in the past and leverage some technologies and features that are specifically designed to not only uh, provide things like A and V, but actually do it easier. So what can the new pieces of technology that we're leveraging do to automate our tasks and make it easier for us to not only manage and, or sorry, design and build the solution, but actually manage the life cycle. And this, this is my final point, which is integration with the IT side of the house. Uh, I'm a networking guy, obviously, and more and more as we develop uh, a dependence on this networking component, we tend to focus on the initial aspect of it in the AV space. We design it, we make sure that it operates, and then we push it over the wall and let somebody else in the IT staff actually manage it without necessarily giving them all the tools that they need to do so. So in the IT space, there's a lot of tools and technologies and frameworks that have historically been around to help you monitor an existing infrastructure, seeing when something goes wrong, and manage it throughout its entire life cycle. And so I think that that secondary angle, not just about the initial design and spec of what it is that's capable of doing from an AV perspective, but also how can we actually manage the life cycle cradle to grave. And that level of focus, um, I think, is going to become more important, especially as customers become uh, more, more focused on this idea of the experience, not just in terms of how do I use it, but how do I actually manage it and maintain yeah. it throughout its life cycle. I mean, it's something to think about, right? I would argue that one of the things that few people do in industry, few people do in their lives, is that they finish school, whatever school means to them, whether that's high school, undergrad, postgrad, and then they think that their life's about doing things, not about learning things. And I'm reading a book at the moment called The Half-Life of Facts by Samuel Arbersman. I actually have spoken to him, but I'm not entirely certain how to pronounce his name. But you can look it up, Half-Life of Facts. And he says, and I think he's right, that basically half of everything you know is not true every seven years. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And it's not true because the facts have changed over time. And, and I talked about this quite extensively in another form. He just he rather nicely uses this half life of facts concept. So all these folks who are, oh, I know all the answers. I've been doing it 25 years. Well, the trouble is, and, and I'm, by the way, one of those people, um, the trouble is most of what I know isn't true anymore. Right. And, and I think that if we don't constantly reinvent ourselves as individuals and as organizations, we're going to get caught by that stuff, which probably loops back to all the other things we've talked about today. Well, yeah. And honestly, not to not, you know, not to, you know, blow smoke, you know, in Simon's directions, your book actually talks about that as well. You yeah. know, well, you know, you've got to rethink how you're doing things. You know, every so often, just because you've always done it this way does not necessarily make it right. So. Um, I'm going to give you guys uh, my three, and, and some of them are, are into yours, and you can tell me I'm wrong, and then we'll, we'll, go, we'll all go home. Uh, merchant acquisitions, absolutely, for a various number of reasons, both from a supply side uh, as well as who you're doing business with. The job market in general, currently the, the job market, at least in the States, is sitting at 4%. That makes it really, really difficult to find talent, which actually kind of goes into all what you guys were talking about. And the last one, and all three of you are manufacturers, and you can, you can tell me I'm wrong the overarching global economic situation i'll put it that way um yes i live in the states and yes you know um we can all have different opinions about who our president is and, and certain things that that he does but there are taxes and tariffs that are going back and forth through different countries and these are going to start hitting the av industry uh, if they haven't uh, already started doing so so however you feel about it from a political standpoint 
right now you you starting in 2019 there are some folks that are that we're gonna we're gonna start feeling some some pinch from that so uh, those are my three. So you can write to me and tell me I'm wrong. So, um, all right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Simon Dudley, always a pleasure, sir. How do people find you and or Logitech? The best, well, logitech.com, not really surprisingly, uh, yeah. at it's Simon Dudley for my Twitter. And of course, I'm pretty ubiquitous on LinkedIn. So find me on all of those. And thanks for the feedback. Absolutely. Uh, also with us, uh, Rob uh, Viren. Rob is from uh, Legrand. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. How do people find you and or Legrand AV? Uh, it's a LinkedIn for myself and uh, Legrand AV. You just got to Google that one or LegrandAV.com. Right, very good. Uh, Jordy, Jordy Cleaver uh, from uh, Biamp. Thank you, sir. Uh, how do people find you or Biamp? Uh, yeah, best bet is to find Biamp is just Biamp.com. We've got a fairly decent website there. Um, I'm available on LinkedIn or via email at jordy.cleaver at Biamp.com. All right, very good. Uh, my name is Tim Albright. Don't follow me on the Twitters, uh, but go by the website if you would please. <laughs> Avianation.tv. Avianation. I'm there. Just you. It, I, I talk about the Bears a lot right now because uh, they're still doing well. Um, for those of you outside the U.S., it's the Chicago Bears uh, American football team. Um, but go by the website, avianation.tv. Avianation.tv, you'll find this program and a host of others, including our weekly residential uh, program that talks about the, you know, the residential side of the AV industry, also our state of control show, our social show, and so many others. Also, while you're there, check out our supporters section. These are the folks who support us financially, help us bring you AV Week and Resi Week and ISC, honestly, in about two months. Uh, and actually, uh, Milestone and, and uh, not Milestone, the Grand AV, uh, and also uh, by Amber, two of those. We thank them for their support. So check all that out and more at avnation.tv avianation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. That's all the time we have for AV Week. Mm -hmm.